All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's been a long week for many of us. Who's been here every day this week? Yeah, it's uh, wonderful content. And thank you so much to the volunteers, our room uh, leaders, our video people. You have been awesome. Uh, and we really appreciate all the work that you've done. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about passion. Um, and just as a show of hands, how many of you either have an open source project or really any cause in your life that you really get excited about and means a lot to you and you like to do when your spare time permits? Most of us, right? Yeah. Um, I think for all of you, and, and maybe even those of you who, who don't have a lot of time to work on things, I think the topic today is hopefully going to get you thinking uh, about some interesting questions. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Michael Downey. I work for an organization called the Digital Impact Alliance, which is part of the United Nations Foundation. And I am leading up a program called the Dial Open Source Center, which is the subject of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I want to talk about it in context of uh, a really challenging um, a challenging issue that we're facing and that there is a risk of this presentation not moving sorry one second try one thing here there we go sorry um, I want to talk a little bit today about how open source software projects are used in some really remote places around the world and some really poor and impoverished places around the world and places we might not always think about. A lot of us think about how we use open source on our personal laptop and use it to do the work that we do every day. But here's a few scenarios for you that you may not have thought about when you think about how open source is used. Uh, think about small businesses, how they run their finances, how they get loans from organizations. Um, because right now, every day, open source software is used to help support those activities. Uh, connecting money, uh, trade prices, market prices. And healthcare, open source is used in almost every country around the world. It manages your information when you go to the doctor or to the hospital. Uh, it helps with teaching and training of healthcare professionals um, and ultimately helps to make sure that the care that you get is reliable and safe. And then finally, just general charity work. When you have nonprofits or other organizations who are going out to help people in their communities, in many cases they're relying on open source software to do that work and to help them manage that information and make sure that they're getting the most out of the money. And the, um, and the reason I'm talking about this is uh, I want you all to think about uh, the risk that's here. Um, as many of you know, a lot of open source software projects are led by a single individual or a very small group of people. And just imagine for a moment if those people were to, decide, were to decide that they're kind of done with the project and didn't really want to continue it, and that project were to kind of stop development, stop maintenance. Think about some of the risk that is involved for a lot of these organizations. So this is really on our mind quite a bit. And when you put that in context of uh, uh, international politics um, and this idea of decreasing uh, funding for international development, um, as well as this idea that sustainability is a growing challenge for, for FOSS projects generally. Um, this really means that we need to think about ways to help mitigate that risk, reduce that risk. Um, and so our project is focused on two ideas here, co-investment and shared resources. Co-investment meaning uh, diversification of getting people to help the project, maybe individuals, it might be money to do certain things, uh, it might be collaborations between organizations. Um, and the shared resources idea um, is about basically working together across multiple projects to share things like infrastructure, uh, tools, uh, training, processes, um, and even contributors that might have expertise that could be shared between one project and the other. And so today, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I thought I would uh, talk about a few things with you all. Um, talk a little bit about the risks in development, and I'll put a little asterisk after development because it's not what you think. Um, also talking about the projects in this space, uh, what they need and what they want to be long-term uh, sustainable projects. Uh, tell a little bit about our goals for these projects, what we found over the last year, um, and then describe kind of what we're planning to build together. And, hopefully for all of you think about how you might make a difference either in some of these projects or how you might also take these ideas back to the open source projects that you're interested in or you're working with and maybe help them become more sustainable over the long term. 
So first things first, uh, I'm going to be throwing around this word development today. And it doesn't mean programming. <laughs> Not just, just for this hour, it doesn't mean programming. Um, it's also known in our, in our circles as digital development, or this wonderful acronym called ICT4D, which is uh, Interna uh, Information Communication Technology for International Development. Um, basically, it's talking about uh, projects that are mission-oriented. They're usually mobile or cloud-based these days. And ultimately, they're trying to work people work with people where they are, working in agriculture or education or healthcare. Um, so that's kind of the field that we're working uh, in, in DIAL and the UN Foundation and what we're focused on. Um, one important thing here that this idea has really shifted over the last few years. Um, it really started as people in what we call the global north, the richer countries, thinking about what technology we need to build for the poor people of the world. Um, and fortunately, that feeling has changed completely 180 degrees. And now it's about helping people create the tools that they need in their local communities to do what they want to do as a community to make their world better. And so we've finally made that shift to empowering people to use the internet, to use technology, just as you or I might use it today. Um, and that's wonderful to see. Um, and people are understanding that open source software is a big important key uh, to making some of those realities possible. Um, why does it matter? Uh, some of you probably know this already, but just under half the world is connected to the internet today and is taking advantage of it. Uh, we would like to uh, see that change. Our organization specifically is about getting people more engaged in what we call the digital society and helping them to you know, make full use of the technology that most of us here in this room use every day. Um, and in order to do that, we need to really think about the building blocks uh, that are kind of fundamental to that. Uh, a lot of it's simple things like getting people connected to the internet. It's been a big theme over the last many years. But fortunately, that problem is getting solved fairly quickly. And so now we need to think about applications and what people are actually doing with that connectivity that they have. And so our organization is specifically focused on how technology is being adopted, or in many cases, neglected. Um, and so if we think about how people are basically helping others to help themselves, like if you're talking about an NGO, helping people to use this technology to improve their communities, uh, it's important to think about what does that look like if it's successful? And this is a very difficult question because just making a lot of cool technology isn't quite the answer. Um, our team, before we formed our organization, uh, worked in, in various teams to do a little study here. And it's a little dim on this screen. But what you'll see here is that year over year, you have uh, an increasing number of uh, mobile applications for healthcare that were being launched. In fact, between the years of 20, uh, or 2005 and 2011, it was up 30%. Uh, so every year there was just this increasing number of applications. Many of them were doing the same thing. And so if you think about all of the money and all of the resources that went in from these charities, these other organizations, to create the same mobile data collection app over and over, there's really a lot of waste there. And we really, start need, we really need to start thinking about how people are using this technology and being a little more thoughtful in what we're building together. And think about how we can work together as, as the open source community at large to re reduce the duplicated effort. Here's a wonderful or a really sad example of that. Uh, this is a map of, of the country of Uganda in, in Eastern Africa. And the names, the black names that you see around the, the perimeter here, are different uh, mobile healthcare application platforms. They're all open source. Well, almost all of them are open source. Um, and the red circles show you kind of how extensively they're used. The big circles are used much more extensively. So this was a snapshot uh, toward the end of 2012. So at one point in time, there were literally all of these very, very similar applications being used in one single country. Uh, obviously, this is a little bit scary that there are so many ap applications serving the same space. And what happened was the uh, Ministry of Health in Uganda actually had to come out and say, no more. We're not going to allow within the healthcare system any more applications to be, ab to be deployed. We really need to start focusing in and uh, reduce this proliferation that's happening. Um, and what this, what this does is it raises a few questions. Um, first of all, why are there so many different tools, many of them open source tools? And why isn't there more collaboration? Why are there so many different groups and organizations building all of these things? And then most importantly, how many resources, how much money is actually being wasted by so much duplication? Um, and a lot of times, this is money from, from taxpayers, from the public. It's from people who are donating to charities and hopefully uh, want to see that money stretched as, as well as it can be. 
Um, so this raises a lot of questions, and this is not the only case where this is happening. It's just one example. Um, and, and when you go back and look at these projects here, the fact that the money is being stretched so thin between so many projects uh, really starts to raise some red flags the more you think about it in terms of risk. Because a lot of those projects that you saw on that map were run by a single organization. Some were run by a single person. Um, that person or that organization could shift their priorities tomorrow. Uh, and then you have to think about what would happen to those, those clinics in Uganda that were using the software. Um, and ultimately, what harm are we indirectly causing uh, in these countries and these places that are using this open source software? So that's where our organization comes in. This is our big fancy organizational chart. Uh, and I'm going to bore you all with, with all of the details. Um, but the, the basics are this, is that we started this organization to help bring people together who are already working in this space. We didn't want to reinvent something ourselves, But we wanted to focus on three areas. Uh, how software and technology is being used. We call that platforms and services. Let's see if my laser works. There we go. Uh, we wanted to think about how open data is being used by these organizations. And then finally, what people are doing with that data and those tools, what we call the insights and the impact. Um, and we do that by working with, with private donors, with governments, with private sector organizations, with corporations, basically anyone who's interested in, in improving this space. Um, true to our kind of United Nations roots, we are really focused on empowering others to do their work. And we don't necessarily want to do their work for them. We want to make them more effective. Um, so those of you who are familiar with the UN, you may have seen some of these things called the Millennia, I'm sorry, the Sustainable Development Goals, formerly the Millennium Development Goals. Um, they are a, a list of 17 things that we can all focus on by the year 2030. And if we can take steps in these directions on one or more of these areas, it should help make our world more peaceful, more more harmonized, basically a better place to live. And so our thinking is by investing in sustainability of open source software in this space, we can work on these six areas. Um, things like gender equality, we already see uh, opportunities for women and other groups to get involved in open source and technology and learn from that. Um, there are work and economic opportunities by leveraging open source for small businesses. Um, there's this idea of building core infrastructure for countries and other parts of the world using open source tools. Um, reduced inequalities, it helps kind of level the playing field, get people access to better health data like we saw in the previous presentation. Um, and 12, most importantly, is this idea of responsible um, kind of long-term thoughtful production. Uh, it goes back to that idea of that map in Uganda where you have all of the, the waste. Um, and the way we do it is, is number 17 by building and strengthening partnerships. Because if you rely on any one single organization, you set something up for failure. So a lot of us talk about sustainability. And you hear it in a lot of different ways. And you, you talk about the environment and waste and all these things. But for today, what's open source sustainability? Um, apparently, it's nothing. There we go. <laughs> um, what we think of sustainability is, is a hedge or a, a bet against burnout for maintainers. And if you've worked in an open source project for very long, most of us have felt a little overwhelmed and get, get a little bit tired. Sometimes you want to quit, or sometimes you just want to take a day off. That's perfectly normal. Um, but you have to think, in these kinds of projects, what's the risk of that happening? Um, organizational strategic shifts, like I mentioned on that map, a lot of these projects are, are driven by a single organization. They could decide to close up shop tomorrow or, or focus on a new area. And we have to think of what happens after that. Um, so we want to think about how do we provide more resources to projects, reduce those single points of failure, and balance the, uh, the geekiness trend that we have to chase new and shiny things. Uh, you know, deploy the latest technology, figure out how to get blockchain into our projects, maybe um, get new features out to people. Uh, we want to balance that innovation with reliability and other things that we should also be investing energy and, and attention to. The important thing here is like, this is not specific to this international development sector. This is really all of open source are, are starting to think about this. Um, and in fact, back in June of last year, uh, there was a really great conference in San Francisco uh, that we participated in. There were 100 different project maintainers and what we called sustainers. Uh, we gathered at the GitHub headquarters one day and spent the day brainstorming ideas of what to do about this. There's a really great report. If you're interested in this, go to sustainoss.org. Um, just freeze, download the PDF. Um, highly encourage you to go read that. Um, I won't read through all these bullet points. But there were some really key takeaways that 
probably aren't too surprising if you've uh, struggled with this very long. Uh, we also did research last year uh, for projects in our sector around the same thing. And not surprisingly, these were about the same. They lined up pretty well. So our group wasn't particularly unique. Um, I'm not going to read all of these out to you. And the numbers are just, they're just numbers. They're not really prioritized. But things like facilitation of collaboration, getting good mentorship, getting direct assistance with things like infrastructure and project management skills that open source software projects often don't have from volunteers. So when we looked at all of these areas, we tried to build a model of what we needed to do and what we wanted to get to. And so we get to this buzzwordy slide that we like to show people um, where you have this magic happy balance at the end of the day where you have people who are doing work together that's effective and collaborative. People are kind of happy in their open source work. Um, and they're getting their motivations fulfilled. So whatever brings them there, they're, they're happy with that. If it's just being able to geek out on technology, that's great. If it's a good feeling about helping people in different parts of the world, they're getting that. If it's to help their organization, they're getting that. And the more this cycle continues, you get this steadily increasing trust. And we see that as the key to long-term sustainability for open source projects, especially in our space. And to get there, we kind of, we've identified four what we call pillars of sustainability. One is having this organizationally neutral home where different uh, groups that are together can kind of collaborate without anyone being too dominant so everyone's voices are heard. Um, having a good technical architecture where there's a good feedback loop from the users coming back in to understand uh, what needs to be built, making sure the right tools are in place for collaboration, uh, that you're using a good test strategy or you have a continuous improvement process in place, or sorry, continuous integration process in place to improve your software. Uh, you've got a vision for the product that you're, you're trying to put out into the world. Um, so this goes to talking to your users, understanding what they're actually wanting and needing, um, and then making sure that the open source group is working together effectively to actually build what, they, what these users want. A lot of us you know, sit there and think, what would these people like to do? Um, and we never actually go out and talk to them. And then finally, and most importantly, to enable all of that is community effectiveness. And this is the idea of having distributed leadership amongst multiple organizations that represent you know, all the orgs and the people who are participating in the project very well. And there's clear governance, decision-making processes are established. So our idea is if we can invest in all of these areas, we'll have this steadily increasing trust and we'll end up with more sustainable projects. And obviously, if you've been around open source very long, the way to do this is through cooperation. Um, we all know, you know the, the benefits and the challenges of that. Um, we looked at some models of how people kind of build good cooperation groups. And there are certainly groups within open source that try to help. Um, things like umbrella orgs that bring different technologies, or different projects using the same technology together and collaborate. There are things like the business or running the accounting for your project. These, none of these had exactly the right offerings for that model on the previous slide to, to invest in all of those areas. So we started looking at some other models out there. Um, we looked at things like artist studio collaborative groups, people who would go in and, and share artist studio space and paints and easels and, and canvas. Uh, we looked at maker spaces and hacker spaces. This is a great example of people coming in and exercising their, their creativity and sharing resources together and kind of collectively deciding what that group should should work on to the benefit of the larger group. So we looked at some of those groups and we tried to find a model that focused on, on sharing but balancing autonomy as well because we knew by talking to these projects they didn't want to give up uh, their own vision for what they were working on nor should they because we really wanted to tap into that mission. And so for our, our group, we came up with this mission of the Dial Open Source Center, which uh, we called this inclusive meta community, basically a community of multiple projects that are working together for knowledge sharing, collaboration, and co-investment, going back to that term from earlier. Um, obviously, we want to promote positive social change. We want to work on the things that we talked about earlier, healthcare, education, economics. Um, and ultimately overcome key barriers to getting good open source projects that are mature and they're going to be impactful out in the world. Um, and we wanted to do that by building a pub what we call a public commons. Uh, things that people could share together, be it knowledge, be it tangible resources. 
tangible or virtual tangible resources like infrastructure um, and actually sharing even collaborators and, and contributors across projects. Because another thing that we saw is people would need experts in healthcare maybe to answer certain questions from time to time in their project. They didn't need to be developers, but they needed certain experts that could come in and help guide them on what they were doing. Um, and that was why the, if you were in here for the last presentation, that was a really great example that sometimes you need an outsider to come in and help guide you to make sure you're doing the right thing. So we have two areas of, of assistance that the organization is designed to, uh, to provide right now. The first is what we call technical assistance. Uh, we have a nice little model and we have kind of a, a menu of services people can choose from. Uh, we sh we sh display it a few different ways. This is kind of life cycle based from early projects to more mature projects. And these are some of the areas where people tend to struggle with from, from our interviews and our research. And so what we'll ab we're able to do is connect people either directly to uh, consultants who are working with or our internal team. Uh, we have some funding for several years to help provide one-on-one -on -one consultation. Experts in open source legal issues, uh, kind of product architects who can help people with more vision kind of questions of what the project should be doing. Um, and at different places, the projects can engage in different ways. And so they're not stuck with one kind of help. Uh, it basically goes from quarter to quarter. We have dialogues with our projects and ask them what they'd like to work on. Uh, we can also have a different way of viewing it if people are really focused on financial issues or, or making the product better or making the community better. We can also talk about the, the services in that way with them as well. So here's the exciting part. We, uh, we started in October. We already have six projects uh, that are participating in the organization. Um, just a, a few words about each of these. Um, they're all really awesome. You should go check them out. Let's look at their web pages. Uh, the humanitarian open street map team, most of us know about open street maps. Uh, HOT, as they call themselves, is basically a way to crowdsource mapping. If you've ever made edits to Google Maps uh, on your phone or on your, on your desktop, uh, you've seen this happen kind of in real time where you can correct data. They will go in after a disaster, uh, get new aerial imagery after an earthquake or something, and the mappers from around the world will go in and very quickly update the OpenStreetMaps layer so the people who are going in and responding after the disaster, be it the Red Cross or some of these other organizations, will have instantly available up-to-date maps that are accurate uh, as of the time that they're going out there. Very important for, for their needs. LibreHealth is a, uh, an umbrella community, a meta community for small healthcare startup projects. Uh, they're working on things like making healthcare projects more turnkey, easy, easy to use for startups and small uh, clinics, radiology offices. Uh, Bomni is also in healthcare, but goes the other direction to hospitals and packages up several different healthcare related projects into one kind of complete system for them that uh, deals with things like uh, schedule and supply management, uh, information management for patients, etc. Open LMIS is a logistics management system. Uh, helps people kind of uh, deal with the issues of, of tracking all of the things that their organization needs to get things done. Sumsurizer is a very new uh, platform for analytics of data from cook stoves. Uh, they're working with a group that builds little IoT devices that go on cook stoves that people may use in their villages. Um, they help track things like uh, gas and environmental issues that the NGOs and the nonprofits that go in and help provide these cook stoves are able to educate them on how to use them more effectively and more safely. And Open Data Kit is a long running project that is an Android-based mobile data collection app uh, and analysis application for charities or other organizations to go out into the field, talk to people, uh, collect data, and then, and then act on it. We've got a lot of service delivery partners. Software Freedom Conservancy um, is able to help our projects with legal issues, with fiscal services like uh, managing your bank accounts, getting uh, trademarks registered for your projects. Uh, Mifos and PATH are working in the finance and the healthcare industries respectively to hook those projects up with finance opportunities for funding opportunities, grants, other collaboration projects uh, where multiple software projects can work together, apply for some really big funding, get a lot of work done for their projects in the process. Um, we're also a sponsor of Outreachy. Does anyone here know about Outreachy? One person. It's really awesome. It's similar to Google Summer of Code, but it's focused on women and other underrepresented groups. They aren't necessarily students, but it helps get them involved in open source, matches them up with a mentor, and pays them uh, for an internship for the summer or the winter. Uh, right now, we're getting ready to do uh, place five different interns through Outreachy. Uh, we did some uh, about six months ago as well. 
So finally, real briefly, uh, we've built this up as an open source style organization. Uh, we've got an independent governance board. We've got groups looking at technical issues, helping the projects work together to, to tackle their, their technical challenges. Uh, a similar group working on community related challenges like diversity, uh, community growth, uh, this idea of sustainability advisory groups in the health sector or the finance sector that I briefly mentioned. So in, in closing, we are now ready to actually do the work. We've, we've got a few groups to start with. And this actually maps very closely with the, the list of needs that you saw earlier. Uh, we have a strategy for each of these areas of, of engagement with the projects. We've already got begun to deliver technical services. Uh, we just helped a, product, uh, a project launch their website, which is going live next week, I think. Uh, so things are actually running already. Uh, we've got a, a long list of projects waiting in the wings as we scale up over the next year. And we've got an open governance plan. Uh, it's all on, on GitLab, and we're iterating, and we're getting feedback, and helping to evolve the project over time. So finally, uh, what do we need to make this thing successful? Um, specifically for this group and the people that you talk with, if you know of any projects that are kind of aligned with this mission that you think might benefit, please send them our way. Um, if you might be connected with an organization that is interested in supporting this kind of work, uh, maybe your, your employer wants to do you know, financial support or are able to give end-kind services or donate time from some of your staff members, all this stuff would be super valuable for our community. Um, so scaling is hard, right? And it is hard for all of the projects that we're working with. So we also need more hackers. We need documentarians. We need designers, um, people that would be interested in working across all of these projects and sharing their time. So if any of this is interesting to you uh, or you know of people who might be interested, please send them our way. We would love to hear from you. All right. So last slide. This is our closing. Uh, an inspirational quote from you, uh, Dorothy Day. Um, we shouldn't get too hopeless. This sounds like a really hard problem, but it's a really important problem. So go back, think about it in your own open source projects, and think about how you can you know, help those projects be more sustainable in the long term. Thank you.